Music. It has long been an art form cherished by mankind. From the legendary works of Johann Sebastian Bach to the tempestuous symphonies of Ludwig van Beethoven, music is most definitely one of the most expressive artistic languages known. While music has an emotional aspect to it, it has a mathematical one as well. The physics of a piano string supplies us with an inclusive theory of musical tones and enables us to predict new harmonies. Similarly, the fundamental forces and various particles found encompassed in nature could be described as nothing more than different modes of vibrating strings. This idea is known as string theory. The term unification has become one strongly affiliated with Albert Einstein, but the undertaking of it has been a prevalent subject matter of modern physics in the past hundred years. Isaac Newton unified the firmaments in Earth by discovering that the same laws governing planetary motion were consistent in a ball in the trajectory of a projectile. Approximately two centuries later, Scottish scientist James Clerk Maxwell advanced the idea of unification by showing that electricity and magnetism were really just two distinct aspects of the same force classified by mathematical formalism. Subsequently, Albert Einstein stated in his famous theory of special relativity that space and time were connective. He demonstrated that motion through one dimension would affect the traversing through the other. Years later, Einstein extended his comprehension with his theory of general relativity, furnishing the most cultivated definition of gravity to date. With these accomplishments, Einstein emphasized that a complete coalescence of nature's forces was feasible. However, by the year of 1930, the perspective of physics had completely changed. Physicist Niels Bohr and a multitude of audacious explorers ventured deeply into the micro-realm of quantum mechanics, a mysterious theory devised of radically unaccustomed concepts and mathematical rules. Despite accurately anticipating the conduct of subatomic particles and atoms, the quantum laws have always viewed Einstein's definition of gravity suspiciously. This precipitated years of despondency, as physicists perseveringly strive but continuously failed to integrate quantum mechanics and general relativity into a single unified theory. Such was the case until John Schwartz and Michael Green published an inimitable paper elucidating that string theory had the ability to conquer the mathematical animus that was present between general relativity and quantum mechanics, paving the way for the potentiality of ultimately reaching a unified theory. Ever since the commencement of the 20th century, the elementary integrants of nature have been preserved as inextricable particles, with the most well-known being electrons, quarks, and neutrinos, that can be viewed as minuscule points denuded of interior machinery. String theory dissents this by suggesting that at the center of every particle is an infinitesimal vibrating string-like strand, and that the variances between particles are a result of how their internal strings vibrate. But the question still remains, is string theory correct? Optimism surged in the 1980s when a paper titled Vacuum Configurations for Superstrings postulated the idea that the extra dimensions required for string theory to work were minuscule, which not only provides an answer as to why we don't see them, but additionally could yield the absent link to experimental validation. Strings are incredibly diminutive that when they vibrate, they oscillate into three large dimensions and supplementary tiny ones. Furthermore, the vibrational structures of strings would be regulated by the shape of the extra dimensions. Since these patterns rule particle properties such as electric charge and mass, properties that are experimentally detectable, the paper indicated that if one is knowledgeable of the precise geometry that comes with the extra dimensions, one can anticipate the outcomes that certain experiments would generate. Being the only idea to date that can derive both the standard model and general relativity, string theory will certainly remain as one of the most active areas of theoretical research. At the heart of it, it distinguishes itself as the most significant idea to many physicists and could possibly become the theory of everything. Over the course of this video, we will discuss Einstein's theory of special and general relativity, quantum mechanics, and the fundamentals of string theory. Due to the fact that I'm kind of restricted to a time limit, I'm going to go a little bit fast. Let's begin. Firstly, relativity is the field of study that deals with how observers in different reference frames measure the same event. Special relativity is founded on two main principles. The principle of relativity, which states that the laws of physics are constant even for objects traversing in inertial frames of reference, and the principle of the speed of light, which states that the speed of light shall remain constant for all observers irrespective of their relative motion to the light source. This theory essentially tells us how to interpret motion between different inertial frames of reference. Einstein said that we shouldn't base our frame of reference on something absolute, but rather on relative motion. For example, if you and I were on different spaceships and wanted to contrast our observations, the only thing that really matters is how fast we are moving with respect to each other. Another key topic we shall make mention of is relativistic mass. We've all seen the equation equals mc squared, but what the hell does it actually mean? Simply put, 
Mass and energy are two forms of the same thing. The c squared value in the equation represents the speed of light squared and is our conversion rate. If this is confusing, think about foreign currencies. British pounds, euros, dollars, they're really just different forms of the same thing. Money. We convert currencies by multiplying the quantity by some fixed constant. In our case, it's the c squared. The same principle applies to mass and energy. By using some algebra, we can rewrite this as m equals e over c squared. This means that an increase in energy results in greater mass. Now, a heavier object is hard to speed up, so it's impossible for an object with a non-zero mass to travel at the speed of light. Another topic is time dilation, which is the very slowing down of a clock with respect to a spectator set in relative motion. Basically, the more that you travel in space, the less you do in time, and vice versa. Lastly, Length contraction is a phenomenon that says that the faster something moves in a particular direction, the more its length will be shortened in that direction. However, this is only really noticeable when an object is traveling near the speed of light. This will conclude our discussion of special relativity. General relativity is Einstein's theory of gravity, and really an extended version of special relativity since it includes areas that are accelerating with respect to each other. General relativity superseded Newton's laws of gravitation by forming a definition of gravity as a property of space and time, also known as space-time. This means that we don't live in three dimensions, but four, three of space and one of time. Firstly, we must learn of the equivalence principle. Basically what this says is that if you're in a windowless box, you won't be able to tell the difference of being in outer space with an upwards acceleration of g, or being in the same box on the surface of the Earth. The second principle is that light bends in a gravitational field. If you were to take the person in the box that is accelerating through space and shine a light from one side to the other, it will take a short, finite amount of time. If the box is accelerating at a rate of g, by the time the light reaches halfway across, this box will have accelerated a tad bit further, which means the light will reach here. We can continue this until the light reaches the right-hand side. Of course, the light is simply propagating in a linear path, but if you look at it from the box, it has gone from the midpoint to a lower point. If I were to redraw this path, it would look like a curve. Now let us travel back to Newton's law of gravitation for a moment. The equation is given by f equals gmm over r squared. In our situation though, light is being bent in a gravitational field, and since photons are massless, this means that one of our m values will be zero, thus rendering this equation as useless for light. Einstein formulated a completely different idea. He said that all forms of motion are represented by movement in curved space-time. Imagine this is the fabric of space-time. If I put a light mass on it, the effects will be minimal. However, if I were to put a heavier mass, notice how it literally warps space-time and causes the little mass to fall towards it. What is happening is that the object is moving along the shortest path in curved space-time. Because we are dealing with a four dimensional continuum, the path an object traces out would be called a world line. In general relativity, the world line of an object devoid of all external non-gravitational forces is a type of geodesic. A geodesic is simply the shortest path taken on a curved surface or sphere. Moreover, a common misconception about gravity is that it's a force. This is wrong. Gravity is not a force. As we have seen, it is a consequence of the curvature of space-time caused by the uneven distribution of mass. It's quite literally the warping of space-time. Lastly, Einstein's field equations explain how the foundational interaction of gravitation is a consequence of space-time being curved by energy and mass. For you nerds out there, Einstein's field equations can be summarized like the following. By first glance, this may look like one equation, but it's actually ten. The indices mu and nu are found in several places and symbolize the dimensions of space-time, naught, one, two, and three. In a non-complicated sense, this equation is just trying to balance two things. Everything on the left refers to the curvature of space-time, while everything on the right relates to energy and mass. If there's one thing I want you to remember, it is that mass tells space-time how to curve, and curved space-time tells mass how to move. Mass creates geometry, and geometry acts like mass. This will conclude our discussion of general relativity. Quantum mechanics is really just the physics that deals with the really small stuff. Matter tends to behave in a peculiar manner at the subatomic level. While Einstein's theories concern the nature of space, time, and gravity, quantum mechanics, on the other hand, deals with everything else. Let us delve into some of the concepts of quantum theory. Firstly, the universe is comprised of four fundamental forces, the electromagnetic, the weak nuclear, the strong nuclear, and the gravitational. The standard model is a theory that provides an explanation for three of these forces, with gravity excluded. Each one of these forces work over various ranges and are varying strengths. Out of the four, gravity is the weakest. However, it spans over a range of infinity. Additionally, the standard model characterizes all known elementary particles. These are the building blocks of matter. Adding on, spin is an intrinsic form of angular momentum found in elementary particles. Particle Particles are assigned a certain number to correspond with their spin. This number either has to be an integer or half integer value. Particles with half integer value spins are called fermions, while particles with integer spins are called bosons. Some other things you should know is that every particle has an antiparticle pair, which basically shares all of the same characteristics, but differs only in charge. Another concept is wave particle duality, which basically says that particles can behave as waves. This duality is deeply implanted in the foundations of quantum theory. Lastly, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle basically states that the more accurately you measure a particle's momentum, the less accurately you will be able to measure its position, and vice versa. This will conclude our discussion on quantum mechanics. 
we have finally made it. Allow me to give a slightly more comprehensive description of string theory. String theory is the idea of substituting point particles with one-dimensional strings that can be either open or closed, and whose lengths are roughly 10 to the negative 33 centimeters long. In consideration of distance scales greater than the string scale, a string would just look like a particle, with its properties being the result of the variances in vibrational modes. In this sense, we can actually view all of the elementary particles as vibrating strings. Additionally, string theory replaces Feynman diagrams with surfaces and world lines with world sheets. If you recall, a world line is the path that an object traces out in four-dimensional space-time. And I know we haven't discussed this, but a Feynman diagram is simply a visual representation of the various mathematical expressions describing the proclivities of subatomic particles. Most physicists would agree that the three forces described by the standard model are understood to a sufficient extent. However, this realization is not inclusive of gravity. That's where string theory kicks in. See, string theory addresses the animus present between general relativity and quantum mechanics by essentially alleviating the amount of quantum uncertainty that burdens the fabric of space. There's a reason why physicists, amongst all other things, chose strings. When you transition from the old idea of a point particle to a string, you're kind of smearing the particle out. Now when you smear anything, dilution is bound to occur. For example, if I take a drop of ink and let it go into a bowl of water, it's going to dilute it and it's going to spread out. Similarly, when you go from a point particle to a string, dilution occurs. And while it may not be obvious at first, that dilution affects the fabric of space itself. If space were to be described as tempestuously undulating in the primitive school of thought regarding microscopic scales, then the strings in string theory, in a way, spread out space. They dilute it. So the quivers in space are still apparent, but they're also less intense. It does this just enough so that general relativity and quantum mechanics can coincide tranquilly. The initial version of string theory was bosonic string theory. However, this only included bosons and left out fermions. Thus, theories called superstring theories prevailed, as they included both fermions and bosons, and introduced a new thing called supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is basically when each particle from one group has an associated particle in the other, and it's known as its superpartner. The superpartner only differs by a half integer spin value. Mathematically, Supersymmetry is the home of weird math. Regular space and time dimensions are denoted by ordinary numbers, which, when commuted, look like x times y equals y times x. Supersymmetric directions, however, anti-commute, so x times y equals negative y times x. Furthermore, there are several different types of superstring theories, with there being type 1, type 2a, type 2b, and two flavors of heterotic string theory. In addition, these theories necessitate the presence of extra dimensions. In bosonic string theory, it needed 26 dimensions, whereas superstring theories only need 10. Now naturally we would say it's pretty hard to visualize all these dimensions of space. However, compactification is one way of decreasing the amount of dimensions in string theory. In compactification, it is assumed that the extra dimensions close up on themselves, or curl up on calabi yau spaces, a type of manifold with Ricci flatness. These extra dimensions are curled up and very small. Moreover, the five superstring theories previously mentioned were all united during something called the second superstring revolution in the form of a new theory. M theory. The main differences in M theory is that there are now 11 dimensions, and not only contain strings, but also multidimensional membranes called brains. Fundamentally speaking, a brain is a physical object that generalizes the proposition of a point particle to higher dimensional space. They can propagate through space-time in ways that are in accordance to quantum mechanics, and can have properties such as mass and charge. Strings are attached at one or both ends to these brains. When you really think about it, a point particle can really be regarded as a zero-dimensional brain, and a string as a one-dimensional brain. Besides point particles and strings, we can also consider higher dimensional brains. These are called p-brains. In short, string theory is, in many regards, the best candidate for a quantum theory of gravitation, which just so happens to unify at the highest energy scales. Now, to check your understanding, why is compactification important? Is it A, because it is the foundation of the Hamiltonian formulation of geometric dynamics in superspace? B, because it assumes the extra dimensions in string theory close up on themselves or curl up on calabi yau spaces, a type of manifold with Ricci flatness? C, because it supplies the underlying litness operator in skirt-skirt theory, which in turn renders it as litty? Or D, because it acts as a tensor in the context of the curvature of space-time and determines the extent to which matter will converge or diverge in time. The correct answer is B. This concludes our discussion of string theory. If I want you to take away one thing from this video, it is that the subatomic particles that we see in nature are nothing more than musical notes on tiny vibrating strings. Physics is nothing more than the laws of harmony, and the universe is a symphony that plays the pieces. For the first time in history, we have a theory explaining the mind of the composer, the mind of God. It is music resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace, and might be our theory of everything. Music